Hi there, boys and girls. Welcome to our vodcast on deoxyribonucleic acid, also known as DNA. DNA is the genetic material that is found in all living organisms, and this genetic material is responsible for the growth and function of all living things on Earth. DNA is a very powerful molecule because it determines a lot about what type of attributes you'll have currently or later on in life. So in this video, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about briefly the discovery of DNA and how that all came about the structure of DNA, how DNA and genes and chromosomes relate to one another, and then the process of replication where DNA copies itself. Now, as we go through this vodcast tonight, boys and girls, and you're filling out your notes, most of the stuff you'll see put up on the screen and you can easily copy down from the screen. However, not all of it will be. So you need to make sure you pay attention and then write down the information that's required and put it into your notes. So keep your eyes and your ears peeled for the facts that you need. All right, boys and girls, let's get started. Whenever you read about the history of DNA, you're always going to come across several famous names. These names include Rosalind Franklin, Erwin Shargoff, and James Watson and Francis Crick. All four of these scientists, amongst others, played a vital role in discovering what DNA was. In the beginning, Rosalind Franklin was a female scientist who was famous because she discovered that DNA was a large spiral molecule. 
And she discovered this because she was able to take photographs of it using x-ray technology. So here's a picture of DNA that she took. Now scientists were able to look at this picture and because of its round nature and the bases going down the middle, they were able to determine that it had some sort of a helical or spiral shape. So it gave confirmation to that. This would be the springboard of the major discovery later by James Watson and Francis Crick on the actual shape of DNA. Now, Erwin Shargoff was a chemist who studied DNA, and he studied the chemical properties of it. And what he came up with were what's called Shargoff's rules. And I'm just going to take one portion of the rules. He has three or four of them. But one of the main rules that would turn out to be extremely critical in understanding how DNA works, how it replicates itself, and how it determines what type of genes and characteristics that you'll obtain was based on the study of the nitrogen bases in DNA. Now, there are four nitrogen bases in DNA. There are adenines, thymines, guanines, and cytosines. And in his studies, he always noticed that the number of adenine bases were always equal to the number of thymine bases, and then the number of guanine bases were always equal to the number of cytosine bases. So if you had 10 adenines, you had 10 thymines. If you had five guanines, you had five cytosines. And we'll talk about more of the importance of this discovery later as we get into replication. And as I said earlier, James Watson and Francis Crick were the first to show that DNA was a shape called a double helix. Now, Rosalind Franklin said it was a spiral, but a double helix is different from a spiral. Based on Rosalind Franklin's research and research of other scientists about the structure and the chemistry of DNA, James Watson and Francis Crick were able to build this model illustrating the actual shape of DNA. And what they found out was that DNA was not a spiral, as Rosalind Franklin said, but it was what's called a double helix, which we'll get into in a little bit. To give you a better picture of what a double helix looks like, your DNA molecules here on the left in its double helix form. So let's talk more about this double helix and the structure of DNA. As I just said, DNA structure has been described as a double helix. Now, if you're not quite sure what a double helix means or, or what it looks like, all you have to do is envision the picture on the right here of this gentleman holding up the ladder. A double helix has been commonly described as a twisted ladder. So if you think about a ladder, how it has two straight sides and then the steps or the rungs going across, that would be the shape of DNA if it was untwisted. And if you took the top and you took the bottom and you twisted the ladder, that would be the shape of DNA. The double helix structure looks like this in 3D. So here we have the flattened version of DNA as it's uncoiled. But as this 3D molecule will show us, as you twist the DNA, you'll see that it takes on a specific type of shape to it. And that's what the double helix looks like. And this is what the double helix looks like if you spin it. So it almost looks like a spiral staircase as well. Now, DNA has this particular shape based on the chemistry of it and its building blocks. Earlier this year, we talked about how carbohydrates were chains of glucose molecules. We talked about how proteins were chains of amino acid molecules that were all bound together. Well, DNA is no different. These building blocks are called nucleotides. They're kind of easy to remember that they're associated with DNA because DNA is a nucleic acid, so nucleotides play into that. Nucleotide has three structures to it. First of all, you have a phosphate group. You have a deoxyribose sugar group, which is why DNA has its name. It's named after the sugar, deoxyribose sugar. And then lastly, we have the nitrogen base. The nitrogen base part of this molecule is interchangeable because there are four different bases. So it's not all the same base. It could be either adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. Whenever you hear about DNA or, or genetic material, you hear the words chromosomes, you'll hear the word genes thrown out there. So let's talk about how they all relate together and, and clear up that picture. One of the best analogies used to help yourself remember the difference between a gene and DNA is this. DNA has always been likened to being one big recipe book. And the recipe book has a whole bunch of different recipes for different types of dishes and foods that people like. So DNA is like the cookbook. The recipes in the DNA are the genes. Ultimately, your DNA is used to make proteins. The genes are the instructions for making the protein. So if you take a look in the upper right-hand corner here, you'll notice that I have a section of DNA boxed off because a gene is a section of DNA. So this particular section would be the recipe for a particular type of protein. Now, proteins are important because they do a lot of things for your body, such as hemoglobin is a protein that's used to carry oxygen in our blood cells. Melanin is a protein that's used to give you skin color, hair color, and eye color. 
our genes, these sections of DNA here, are what makes the proteins what they are. These genes are the recipes inside of the cookbook. So this particular section of DNA would be the gene for one protein, and then another section of DNA would be recipe for other proteins that the body needs to make. Now, as you can see here, if you follow along this whole DNA strand, this DNA strand will then start to wrap itself around proteins at the bottom. And the reason why it does that is because when the DNA wraps itself around the proteins, it causes the DNA to condense, and then we can hold the DNA in structures called chromosomes. And the chromosomes are the actual structures inside of the nucleus that contain the DNA and thus containing all the genes that you have in your body. Now, every cell in your body, for the most part, has chromosomes with the exception of blood cells. Because your cells need the DNA, your body has to replicate DNA and make copies of DNA for all the new cells that are being produced. So let's go over and talk about how DNA is copied inside of your body. Now, as we said before, DNA is always found in the nucleus of cells. So when you ever you look into the nucleus of cells, you're going to find the chromosomes, and then as we just saw, wrapped in the chromosomes are DNA molecules. So here's an example of a DNA molecule we have floating around in the nucleus of a cell. Now we're going to talk about a process called replication. Replication is where DNA makes an identical copy of itself and makes a replica. So in order to make a copy of itself, the DNA uses a simple two-base pair system. And the two sets of pairs that are used in DNA replication are adenines and thymines. They bond together. And we have our guanines and cytosines. They bond together. So those are the two sets of pairs that are used in DNA replication. And if you take a look at this molecule here, what you'll notice is that the G's and C's are always together. And you'll notice that the A's and T's are always together. This is the key to understanding how DNA works. You need to know this because you'll be lost and you'll be confused if you don't remember that G's and C's go together and A's and T's go together. So let's talk about the process of replication. Step one, in order to replicate your DNA molecule, you have to unzip the DNA molecule. So it'll uncoil, become straight and flat as we see on the screen here inside the nucleus, and we need to unzip it. So the first part of step one is to have an enzyme attached to the DNA. That's what this blue structure here is. This particular enzyme is called helicase. And what helicase is going to do is it's going to move down the DNA structure and break the bonds that hold the guanines and cytosines together and the adenines and thymines. So it's going to look something like this. As you can see, the two halves of the DNA have now been separated and they've now been split. What we now have are what are called template strands. So the two strands that remain are called the template strands. They are the patterns that are going to be used to create identical copies of the DNA molecules. So let's move on to step two when we start talking about the new halves that will be built, and they are called complementary strands. So as you can see, you have your two template strands of the original DNA molecule. Inside the nucleus, you're going to have your free-floating nucleotides. And remember, the nucleotides include the nitrogen base, the sugar, and the phosphate group. So the first thing that happens in step two is this. You have free-floating nucleotides in the nucleus, and they start to match up with the template strands. So floating around the nucleus, you'll have nucleotides, and they're going to move to where they match up. So remember, your adenines always bind with the thymines, and your guanines always bind with the cytosines. So based on their chemical properties, that's why they bond to one another and they connect to one another. So this strand right here that we created is called the complementary strand. It's the strand that complements or matches up with the template strand. And then our other molecule is going to have their complementary strand built as well. Okay, so just a reminder, your adenines bond with the thymines and your guanines bond with the cytosines. And then your complementary strands begin to form. Once you get your complementary strands start to form, we're then going to move on to the third and final step of replication. Now that we have our complementary strands kind of organized here, what's going to happen next is the bonding of the complementary strands. So when the complementary strands are bonded to the template strands, we're going to create our two identical DNA molecules. So the first thing that needs to happen in step three is this. You need to have an enzyme attached to each DNA strand. So in this case, 
The enzyme that attaches to the DNA strands are called DNA polymerase. And that's what these green structures are. Next, what will happen is that these enzymes are going to move along the strands, bonding the adenines with the thymines and the guanines with the cytosines. So as polymerase moves on down the DNA strand, it's going to connect nucleotides together, creating one DNA strand, and then this polymerase will move in the opposite direction, bonding those nucleotides together. And as a result, you can see that we have two identical DNA strands that are formed. So what I'd like to do before we end this podcast, boys and girls, just show you a clip as to what this looks like in real time and in actual motion instead of this two-dimensional representation that I've shown you. DNA replication is defined as the process by which an organism's original DNA is used as a template for the production of a new complementary DNA strand. An enzyme called helicase unwinds the original DNA's double helix, creating a replication fork. Next, an enzyme named DNA polymerase 3 works down the leading strand and up the lagging strand of the replication fork, synthesizing two new strands of DNA by taking free nucleotides and pairing them with the complementary bases on the original DNA template. The process of DNA replication is described as semi-conservative because the two copies of DNA produced each contain one strand of the original DNA and one entirely new DNA strand. All right, boys and girls, that concludes tonight's vodcast on DNA. I hope that was clear and easy. Have a good night.